Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. Extremely excited to be recording my second part here of an updated look at some of the futures around the NBA. In this video, we're gonna talk about the worst futures in the NBA. If you guys did not catch my best futures, that video came out yesterday. I'm going to uh, make sure to put a card for that right here for you so you don't miss out on that. And now let's jump into it. If you guys do enjoy the content, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content. And in this video preview, let's talk about what we're gonna be discussing in this one. In my best futures video, I talked about 10 different NBA franchises. The worst futures, well, I only have four to really discuss. I wanted to harp on four different teams and point to some of the flaws in their roster building, some of the flaws in their overall team construction, and some of the flaws in the way that they've gone about building their teams up, and then obviously the long-term ramifications that we will likely see from those decisions along the way. This is going to be more of a long-term outlook for these teams. So some of these teams, in fact, three of the four are gonna be quite good probably next year. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be a bad future team as soon as next season or in two years. What I'm really looking at is long-term ramifications and long-term problems posed by their current collection of draft assets, their current collection of pieces, the current age of their roster. All of those things kind of factor into my analysis on who I believe has the four worst futures in the NBA. And it's a big question here how you define worse. This is a very subjective list once again, because is the worst thing in the NBA being stuck in the middle, picking 12th or 13th every single time, having real no direction, no chance at ever contending for a title, while also not being able to bottom out and get top end talent? Or is it falling all the way down to the bottom without owning some of your own future draft picks? We're gonna talk about those two different scenarios quite a bit in this video. Things can change quickly, though, in the NBA. It takes a couple of moves, one or two clever trades, one or two clever free agency signings, uh, just a few different things to reshape the direction of your organization. So even though this video is going to sound kind of like a obituary for these four teams over the next decade or so, the reality is with smart management, smart front offices, if you're able to take advantage of one specific team or kind of leverage your trade market in a certain way, you could definitely get yourself out of this scenario rather quickly with the right move. So this isn't to tarnish these four organizations, it's just to give a good outlook at where these four teams sit before the draft, before free agency. Remember, I'll be recording a second part after the draft and free agency as well with an updated look at how these teams project to go moving forward. So the team with the fourth worst future here in my estimation is the Los Angeles Clippers who obviously have a lot of their assets out the door to form this big three trio of Kawhi Leonard, James Harden, and Paul George. And one of the biggest issues I've had with people discussing the uh, Paul George trade, finally now, for the first time in half a decade, the Oklahoma City Thunder finally won more games than the Los Angeles Clippers and they finally advanced further in the postseason than the Los Angeles Clippers. Now, people are gonna say, well, yeah, this, that, and the other thing. Listen, part of the reason OKC is so good, a big part of why they are where they are is not only the fact that the Clippers dealt with injuries, that's part of why Jalen Williams was the pick at number 12 for the, uh, for the Thunder, because that was the year the Clippers did not have Kawhi Leonard the entire season, and Paul George missed about 50 games with an elbow injury as well, but, a big part behind OKC's own individual success is their ability to tank after making those trades. Getting Chet Holmgren second overall is a direct result of trading away their own talent. It is their own selection that brought that player in. And I think the picks are way less of a big deal from that trade than the acquisition of Shea Gilgis Alexander. That was something I said well before I even started YouTube. That trade went down before I started YouTube. But my best friend was a big time Clippers fan, still is, and he was heartbroken to see Shea Gilgis Alexander go. Uh, I think that's been really the, the big ramification from that trade is just the fact uh, that they lost in that deal. They lost Shea Gilgis Alexander, obviously now projecting to be an MVP candidate for the foreseeable future. The Clippers now on the back end of their run. Obviously, they haven't gotten to the mountaintop. You can't justify the trade because they haven't won at the highest level. They haven't even made an NBA Finals. But in theory, I can't hate on that trade because it put them in a position to change the entire narrative of their franchise. But now that we're on the back end of that trade, five years later, after the Paul George trade, the Clippers are now in a spot where they're going to see some of the long-term fallout from that decision. It doesn't mean that they necessarily lost the trade. 
OKC, if, if the expectation here is that the Clippers had to win a finals to make that trade worth it, then my opinion should be that the Thunder should have to win a trade or win uh, win an NBA finals to show that they won that trade. Because if the Thunder never make a finals or if they never win a finals, how can we say that they benefited more than the Clippers did? Now, I, I in my opinion, that ring culture is very bad nuance, is very bad discussion for these NBA franchises because it's so hard to win an NBA championship. You can put yourself in position time and time and time again, but maybe things just don't go right. And for LA, that is really hinged on Kawhi Leonard's knee. Honestly, that's been one of the biggest fallouts for them is just the health of Kawhi Leonard. But the Clippers, just with their average age of the roster, the amount of draft picks that they owe out the door, the likelihood is that within the next five to six years, we see some really bad Clippers teams. Now, this is where time out the NBA can change quickly. After some of these guys are gone, if Paul George leaves in free agency this summer, who knows about James Harden, Kawhi Leonard, after his contract's up, the Clippers could theoretically position themselves once again to make a run at more star players in free agency once they have more control of their own future draft picks down the road as they kind of regenerate to them. They could look to make another big trade for another star. The Clippers are a team that even after disaster with their market, their city, their owner who is willing to spend oodles and oodles of money, the Clippers could still be a team that recovers nicely after this. But just with their current collection of assets, I do think that overall their future is going to be pretty bleak, uh, especially within the next five or six years. Then we go on to the Brooklyn Nets. And this is one of those where you have to ask yourself, is it okay to be stuck in mediocrity? And the Nets don't really have much of another choice, honestly. They owe a lot of their draft picks out the door to the Houston Rockets back from the James Harden trade, a trade that at the moment in time looked like a no-brainer. That Brooklyn Nets team, had they stayed healthy, probably would have hoisted a Larry O'Brien trophy, but the entire world fell apart around them. COVID broke up Kyrie Irving uh, and his ability to play home games for the Brooklyn Nets. James Harden pulled his hamstring in the playoffs. Giannis undercut uh, Kyrie Irving on a layup. That shortened his 2021 postseason. The year that the Milwaukee Bucks ended up winning the NBA Finals, the Brooklyn Nets maybe would have been the team if they stayed healthy, if things go right, if Kevin Durant wore a shoe size smaller, maybe they would have won that year as well. The, the Net, that Nets team was so filthy and so disgusting. Again, I can't blame them for the decision to trade for James Harden because when that trio was on the floor together, very rarely, but when they were on the floor together, they were unstoppable. They were one of the best teams we've ever seen put together. Now, we didn't get the longevity there. You can't say that because of the fact that they played together like a total of 25 games or something, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Kevin Durant dealt with a lot of injuries. Kyrie Irving obviously dealt with the vaccine situation. Just everything fell apart around them. And now they're in a spot where they're on the back end of that. They do have the Phoenix Suns picks, which I think will be very promising and beneficial down the road for Brooklyn. But at the same time, they're not in a spot where their team's going to win 40 games, 45 games right now. So they're not really a, a true playoff contender. They're not really a true playoff team. They do have some nice players. Mikhail Bridge is a very valuable player. Nick Claxton, a really good player. He's going to get a big time contract this offseason with the Nets, I would presume somewhere around five years, $125 million. It's kind of my current estimation for Nick Claxton. They also have young up and coming guard Cam Thomas, who I loved out of LSU. I thought that was a genius pick by Sean Marks in that Nets front office when they took him. Uh, obviously, his shot creation diet is very, very impressive. I do like some of the individual pieces in Brooklyn. The issue, though, their team is really void of a true top-end star, and at times that's the hardest thing to get. And in my Best Futures video, I highlighted teams like uh, Washington and Charlotte, who I think are in positions to add those types of players because of where they're going to be picking in the draft and where they're going to uh, fill out their roster and be an attractive landing spot because of the direction their franchise is headed. I don't see Brooklyn being able to pull that off again. Now, obviously, they were able to accomplish that signing Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving simultaneously in free agency way back when, but now they're faced with a different challenge. They have these draft picks. Maybe they could go out and try and find, a, find someone via trade, but that player is going to have to be a top 10-ish player in the world. It can't be Donovan Mitchell. It has to be someone far better than that, in my opinion, to win at the highest level. And I, I just don't know if Brooklyn's gonna have the flexibility to get there. They're in a spot where they can't really bottom out. 
because of the amount of picks that they owe to Houston unprotected and swaps that they owe to Houston. We already see them sending number three in this year's draft to the Rockets. The Nets are just in a tricky spot and it's gonna take some really fine decision-making to work their way out of it. Again, things can change quickly in the NBA. Sean Marks has been a part of a lot of different transactions. He's really moved the needle quite a bit for the Nets over the last decade or so, but I do think there's a lot to overcome currently for the Brooklyn Nets, and I think just with the amount of assets they owe out the door, the current construction of their roster, even though they have some nice quality young players or players in their prime, they're just a bit away, in my opinion, from being able to be a real consistent playoff contender I thought that maybe they would have been a team for Damian Lillard. Maybe the outlook of the team would look a little bit different with that type of shot creator at the helm. They don't have that player though. I'm not sure if they're ever gonna be able to get that player. So as a result, I think being stuck in mediocrity here with the danger of sending top picks to Houston puts the Nets firmly in my top four worst futures in the NBA currently. Then at number two, I have the Milwaukee Bucks. Talking about Damian Lillard, their big four with Adrian Griffin, wait a minute. I mean, Doc Rivers, that gives a little bit of insight to how that first season went together, right? Well, Doc Rivers wasn't much better than Adrian Griffin. In fact, the record was way worse. The offense completely fell off a cliff because Doc Rivers went to his homeboy, Patrick Beverly, and pulled Malik Beasley out of the starting lineup. Well, guess what? It didn't age super well. I know Malik Beasley stopped making shots as well in the second half of the season. I'm not saying Malik Beasley's a perfect player, but the offense did kind of collapse with Malik Beasley out of the starting rotation and part of that as well Giannis dealing with some injuries the Bucks were very very banged up by the end of the year think about the playoffs they missed Giannis and Dame for a couple of playoff games Giannis of course missed the entire playoff series against Indiana but the issue is it's hard for me to have believed in Milwaukee going into that series they faced the Pacers five times during the regular season they lost four of those matchups head to head I think the Bucks are a team that really was tested by Indiana from a scheme standpoint. And that is one of the big flaws with having Brooke Lopez as your starting center in the year 2024. Now I think Brooke Lopez is a very good player, but for a team that traded out Drew Holiday, sacrificed all of their point of attack defense, their perimeter defenders who can navigate screens, stay attached to ball handlers, they really neglected that part of their roster in the trade for Damian Lillard. Yes, they indexed on offense. They have a very talented core four here offensively. One that I do still believe can win at a high level. But defensively, with Brooke Lopez sitting so far back in drop coverage, you're really reliant on your screen navigation and the ability to challenge shots on the perimeter while navigating screens, while working through ball screens. And Damian Lillard's not good at that. Chris Middleton's not good at that anymore, especially as he's kind of aged a little bit. We've seen a real slippage on the defensive end of the floor from him. And Doc Rivers doesn't like to play the young guys. I think Andre Jackson Jr. could be a very valuable piece for Milwaukee long-term. I also still like the upside of Marjan Beauchamp if they keep him and actually give him play time. The issue though is Doc Rivers doesn't believe in playing the young guys as much as he probably should have. Because so those are some of the best defensive players they had, some of the most athletic players they had. And when every time I watch Milwaukee, despite having arguably the most athletic player in the world, in Giannis Antetokounmpo, it just feels like the team lacks true athleticism, positional size, length, uh, defensive versatility. Those are some things that are just lacking. And then you look at their actual draft pick window here. They don't have access to any of their draft picks essentially to trade. They can trade, I believe, two second round picks this offseason. They just don't have a lot to work with. They don't have a ton of contracts that are super desirable either. To trade, obviously, if you broke up this core four, you'd have some interesting pieces. Damian Lillard would have trade value. Brooke Lopez would, in a vacuum, have trade value, I would have to assume, and Chris Middleton would have trade value. But then if you're making that trade, it feels like, okay, well, we're breaking up this core four. That doesn't really make much sense. And then from your bench, Bobby Portis, Pat Connaughton, I like both of them as individual players. I just don't know if those are the pieces that Milwaukee really needs. But the issue is who's gonna go out there and pay top dollar or an expensive price to land either of those players so Milwaukee's kind of at a spot where they just don't have a lot of flexibility they don't have a lot of long-term upside in my opinion when it comes to improving their roster while having a real pick deficit I think looking at their average age of the roster Dame's well into his 30s Brooke Lopez is into his late 30s now Middleton's well into his 30s Giannis uh, is not a young buck anymore either so this team is quite old. Obviously, they have that trump card where they could trade Giannis Antetokounmpo and, and really just shape the direction of this franchise and getting probably the biggest trade offer in NBA history for him. Probably you're looking at four or five first round picks. You're looking at some good young talent. It would completely reshape the deck here for Milwaukee if they were to ever consider trading Giannis or if he were to ever ask for a trade. But at that point, that kind of 
points to exactly what I'm saying here. If you're forced to trade Giannis Antetokounmpo, it means he stopped believing in your future. It means he stopped believing in your organization, the ability for your franchise to put him in spots to win NBA championships. They've been knocked out in the first round two years in a row by very different style teams. Indiana's pick and pop offense really broke Milwaukee's defense all year long, I, I referenced already. Last year it was Miami's dribble handoffs with Bam Adebayo channeling into DHOs with specific Heat players, especially Duncan Robinson had a really good series last year in the first round. Uh, the Bucks, I think, are very, uh, very, very dangerous offensively, but also a team that uh, plays with fire on the defensive end of the floor just because of how limiting Brooke Lopez's deep drop coverage is for them. Even though he's really fantastic in that role, I think he's one of the better defenders in the league in a vacuum. When you get to the playoffs and you can only play one way, there's a lot of danger that exists because of that. So we'll see over the next couple of years if Milwaukee plays Giannis at the five more, if they put him on centers more and try and hide Brooke Lopez on a different player, that could also make some sense. We'll see what they want to do. But I think for the Bucs, uh, going forward in the future, they're just going to have some real difficulties in trying to upgrade this roster and eventually they'll age out of real contention, if not by next year or the year after. Now the team with the worst future in the NBA and that is the Phoenix Suns. And you guys know I've been extremely low on the Phoenix Suns since the moment they traded for Bradley Beal and this was the most foreseeable conclusion for the Phoenix Suns. They were not a good team this year. I tried telling everyone before the season, I tried telling everyone the moment they traded for Bradley Beal, I don't believe in the Suns experiment. I think Matt Ishbia is a terrible owner. I think there's gonna be a new rule named after him called the Ishbia rule to mirror the Stepien rule, but the new rule will be that an NBA owner cannot make trades in the first six months of his tenure as owner. Because you think about what he's done since coming in. He traded away all of their first round draft picks, all of their second round draft picks essentially. He traded away Jay Crowder, yes, who wasn't playing for them at the time. That's okay, that's understandable. Traded away Chris Paul, Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson. Traded away all of these different pieces to land Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal. In a vacuum, landing Kevin Durant, I can't hate on that decision. Kevin Durant's one of the 25 best players in NBA history. He's an incredible talent, incredible shot maker. The duo of Booker and Durant is terrifying. The issue though is they completely went against all basketball logic. They got a third player with a very similar play style to Durant and Booker in Bradley Beal, but someone who was just significantly worse than both of them. These three all have injury history. Getting bounced in the first round by the Minnesota Timberwolves in epic fashion, a, a complete sweep where the Suns just looked completely outmatched for basically 48 minutes of all four games. It was unsurprising to me. Phoenix is not a good team. Listen, they don't really have any flexibility either. They owe all of their draft picks out the door. They've already owed pick swaps to a bunch of different teams as well in other deals. They traded a pick swap to Memphis as part of a trade for David Roddy, who didn't even play in the playoffs for them. Like The Suns have just made a bunch of questionable decisions, time in, time out over the last 12 months since Matt Ishbia became the owner of the Phoenix Suns. And the Bradley Beal contract is one of the worst in the NBA. Not only is it a lot of money for a lot of years yet, but he has a no trade clause as well that he didn't waive. Phoenix could have forced him to waive it before agreeing to trade for him. Somehow the Wizards walked out of that trade with value. It's shocking to me that they were able to pull that off. Part of the reason why I'm so high on Washington is the fact that they were able to pull something like that off is just incredible to me. Phoenix, I think, is on the complete other end of the spectrum. They have no idea what they're doing. Uh, James Jones is just listening and, and bending his knee to Matt Ishbia to keep his job safe. They've already fired a, uh, a head coach as well in, uh, well, they fired two head coaches now, in Monty Williams, who, I mean, that makes sense, right? But then also Frank Vogel, who is a championship level head coach, won a championship in LA, uh, they fired him and blamed all of the roster flaws on the coach. Well, guess what? The roster is not gonna get better by firing the coach. Mike Budenholzer is gonna have his hands full. I do think Budenholzer is a good coach. I think if there's anyone equipped to try and figure it out with this grouping, it's him. But at the same time, there's just a lot of flaws to overcome. The Phoenix Suns don't have control of their future. And at the end of the day, I feel bad for Devin Booker because he's the young guy who once Durant's done playing and once Beal is in a final year of his contract making like $62 million or whatever, doesn't really care about winning. Booker is going to be the one sitting there saying, what happened to the team I went to the NBA Finals with? What happened to Mikhail Bridges? What happened to Cam Johnson? What happened to my surrounding talent? And Phoenix, unfortunately, has sacrificed all of the young surrounding talent. They traded DeAndre Ayton now for Yusuf Nurkic and Grayson Allen. They pushed all of their chips in to win now, and they got 
less far than they've gotten in the past. And that is a direct result of bad decision making. I think the Phoenix Suns front office and ownership is incompetent. And I think that a lot of heads are going to start rolling there in the Suns front office. I think jobs are going to be lost. I think uh, GMs, I think executives are going to be looking for new places to live and new, new places to work after the next couple of years because Matt Ishby is not a patient guy, but the issue is he's part of the problem. In fact, he's the biggest part of the problem. So Phoenix is not a place that is going to set up sustaining uh, sus sustenance for winning. There's gonna be a lot of real problems there over the next couple of years. And I think Phoenix uh, has the worst future in the NBA and I don't even really think it's that close. Thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to comment your opinions down below. Let me know who has the worst futures in the NBA. Are there any teams I left off on this list that you think belong on here? There were a couple I considered for maybe a fifth spot. Let me know. Do you think LA, do you think Brooklyn, do you think Milwaukee and Phoenix are in that right order? How would you rank these teams? Let me know down in the comment section below. Really appreciate each and every one of you guys. Thank you all so much for watching. Leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more, and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.